Using a mist of synthetic sweat, the corrosion test exposes strings to elements mimicking a human finger. Over time, excess remains strong, while other strings corrode and become damaged. Testing complete. This is Chris Keys for from your guitar. You know this guy. This is Pete Thorne. Hey, I'm Pete Thorne. How's it going? <laughs> ha! We have the riff. We are actually in the tone zone of Pete's setup. You guys probably are familiar with this. You probably watch his videos a bunch. This is exactly what it looks like, exactly how you envisioned it. Now we're going to talk about all the stuff that you have that you always be playing for your videos, Pete. What should we start with here? Is your signature, right? This is my signature guitar. Yeah, that uh, we just brought out uh, with. Uh, so this is my second signature model. And uh, the nice folks at Sir Guitars have done a wonderful job on it. So I've been working on this uh, for a couple of years with them. So it's just uh, kind of the, uh, the natural sort of place to go. I've got a previous uh, signature model that's a two humbucker model. Mm. That's basically like everything about that guitar, uh, wood-wise and everything, is kind of like our favorite guitar from Kalamazoo mm. uh, style guitar, but in a 25.5 yeah. scale. So with this one, I thought, let's go with a little bit more of our favorite guitar from Fullerton Vibes, but <laughs> all the imperfections all, you know, worked yeah. out and all that stuff. So, yeah, yeah so, um, so this one is a little bit more of that true S style guitar with like, uh, it, it still got a humbucker in the bridge here. But I went with a single coil on the neck this time, the hum single single setup. And it's a little more of the typical woods uh, compared to my previous signature model for an S style guitar. So, in other words, alder body, you know, maple neck, that kind of stuff. Yep. Whereas the other one's mahogany and stuff. So, yeah. And yeah. are these John's pickups? John's like uh, sewer pickups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's a, a V60, uh, sorry, V63 in in the uh, the neck i used to use a pickup from him another great model called the v60 lp okay. but i've been using these v63s and they're just killer so the two singles are v63s um and then this is a brand new pickup called the thornbucker 2 that we developed oh. yeah so a, a little while back we did this crazy thing where we put together i think it was like 24 different pickups and tried to kind of like go for the eddie van halen early days uh, you know the, the the whatever formula he was using, and we went on this whole tone journey of trying to you know try all these different pickups yeah. to see what got us you know and and of course when you what got us closest to to that thing and of course when you do that you learn a lot in the process outside of you know the Van Halen sound yeah. or anything like that and what I learned was I'm starting to really like especially kind of like with gain like you were just hearing me play mm -hmm. I'm starting to really like Alnico two magnets so this pickup is is my first Alnico two uh, model. Uh, and it's also the first, I do believe, Alnico 2 model that Sir has done. What do you find pleasing to your ear and through that so, journey that gets you to that happy place? It's just when I go up here, it's a little bit more of a singing thing and a little rounder on the top end. And it's got a spongy kind of slightly softer thing on the bottom end than, uh, say, if you go Alnico 5, it's a little sharper, a little more treble attack and okay. stuff. And I used to really, you know, I, I still like pickups like that sometimes. And there's so many other things that go into pickup uh, right. design besides magnets. Yeah. But I did hear across the board kind of when you go from a five to a four to a two, you know, you're getting progressively, this is a, a blanket statement once again, but you're getting to me a little bit rounder and a little bit sweeter in the top end with each Okay. You know, as you go towards the Alenco too. Yeah. So I just really liked it. And um and uh but but uh we also did a slightly hotter wind than my previous signature pickups. So we went up to nine K. So it's okay. still on the it's on the hot end of a PAF, but it's not a hot pickup really. Yeah. Think, you know, and you were yeah. a big PAF fan. Like yeah. you, like Pete, if you don't know, is a long time contributor, was a long time contributor for the tone tip section of the magazine. I know you did like a uh, decoding the PAF article that's still one of our most popular. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah, you ce you celebrate the PAF flag and I know now it's all in vogue, but yeah, you've been there for a long time. 
Yeah, I love them, man. I mean, because, you know, I think the the thing about the PAF, the original thing was they weren't really going for, like, a hot, loud pickup. They they were kind of happy with P90s, I think, or whatever was in their guitars at the time. Yeah. They just wanted hum, hum canceling. Yeah. So, you know, they're not really that much. Like, when you hear PAFs, the best ones to me from back in the day, it's and it seems like what, you know, folks that are really, like, aficionados of that tone go for is an almost sort of single coil-like vibe. Uh, maybe with a bit more heat, but like, you know, in the middle position, the whole Jimmy Page thing, like yeah. some twang and like a big overgrown telly. Yeah. So I love that sound. Yeah. What should we know? Uh, is there anything special to the switching that you have here? Or is yeah, it just a standard five way with the HHS, HSS setup? There is. Okay. Um, so with the switching, uh, you've got basically like a split position here in the, I guess, what people call position two. I mm -hmm. was used, I'm old enough, we used to call this position four. But, <laughs> but people call it two now, so I'm going to call it two. All right. So yeah, full, you know, series humbucking in the bridge, and then here these two will split. But if I'm in the bridge and I pull this, now this is in parallel. Oh. And a, and a humbucker in parallel, with gain right now, you won't notice that much loss of, of volume. <laughs> But it gets thinner and a little spankier. Now, if I go over to the clean channel on the amp here, you can really hear yeah. what it's doing. Yeah. And then... It's almost like a single coil, and it almost balances like it, and, and it's hum canceling in that in that position as well. So, the long story short, the parallel thing, bridge humbucker and parallel, it's become a big like asset yeah. to different things that I do. I just did a tour with the band Fight for Fighting, and I used that sound a lot. Huh. That stringy kind of like almost single coil. Yeah, it almost um, gives it like an acoustic quality, like a plugged in acoustic. It does kind of sound sort of like a yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you compress it a little bit, and maybe add like a little bit of you know, so you pump it up a little bit and stuff, but go for. <laughs> So I really like that sound. I found that really useful in the kind of Americana uh, sort of sound that Five for Fighting, that band oh. has. So it, it came in really handy, so I'm glad I have it. So that's the switching, um, the kind of unique thing. The other unique thing I should mention on this guitar is maybe the neck shape and the bridge, if you're interested. Okay, in yeah, but absolutely. This, this is time to geek out. Okay, cool. Well, this bridge is fantastic. This is designed by Trev Wilkinson, and it's sort of born out of conversations, I think, that Trev had with John Sir over years, and, and Trev also just makes wonderful stuff. So it's got um, little Allen screws that actually lock on oh, top wow. of the strings into the bridge. So it's essentially, it's a locking bridge like a Floyd Rose, yeah. but with a traditional block, traditional string through the back design. Um, so it just is, long story short, if you got a good nut on your guitar and locking tuners. You can work it out. <laughs> it stays in tune yeah, real well. It's got a really, really good, uh, you know, tuning stability. Um, so, so that's really great, and I love that because I hate being out of tune. Yeah. So, I like the number one thing is it's like if people are like, "What's your favorite pedal that you can't do without?" I'm like, "The tuner." <laughs> if I don't have a tuner, you can have the best amp or the best guitar, yeah. the best pedals, and everything sounds terrible. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. out of tune, so yeah. So, anyways, um, so that's really cool. And then the neck on this guitar was digitized off of a Sur that I got around 2008 or nine. Um, it was a guitar that was kind of hanging around the shop, a three single coil classic S Strat type, you know. And um, a dealer hadn't taken it because there was one small mistake they made when they built it on the order. So it was this beautiful green, I don't actually have it here right now, but this beautiful green classic S. And it just has this great neck that's not dissimilar to a guitar I'll show you in a bit, which is my old Strat. It's okay. over there in the corner, my old 60s Strat. So it's a little bit of a soft V in the back, and then it just becomes a full C right here. And we digitized the neck off that Sur, uh -huh. which is a very unique, I've never felt another one quite like it. And John said, I think I hand shaped this probably back in the day. Like, oh, like wow. he used to go out in the shop on weekends, and sometimes he'd pick up necks and yeah. sand, sand them and stuff. And uh, he said, I think I shaped this one. And it's just a great neck. So it's, it's kind of a very, I mean, if you're into 60s strats and stuff and it kind of, the, you know, the vintage thing, but with a modern radius and big frets and all that, I think it's it's just a beautiful neck. It's kind of the best of both worlds in yeah. terms of old and meets new. Totally. I got to ask, what was the mistake? Uh, it got built with a 
uh, a top jack, and they wanted a jack like this on it, a side jack, actually. I feel like that's a, you know, uh, you can let that go under the rug in terms of you acquiring the instrument and yeah. making it your own. I mean, it was a, it was such a not a big deal to me. Yeah. And it, it's got a beautiful, I mean, it's got a Brazilian rosewood fingerboard back when there was more of that going on when yeah. it was built and stuff, and it's just a gorgeous guitar, so... Um, so yeah maybe before we move on I, I see strings and as you can imagine in Pete's little uh, tone den here uh, there's gear everywhere but what are, you, what are you using for strings specifically so primo slinkies okay so uh, that's what you're using yeah I went to primos uh, which is a 9.5 to 44 uh, kind of a newish thing for Ernie Ball I, th I believe uh, Daddario were maybe the first folks that did that, and then Ernie Ball came out with a nine, uh, the the in between gauges. Yeah. You know, the and uh, when Ernie Ball did it, I, I moved over right away. It was funny. I was like using tens for years, and I'm like getting older and stuff, and maybe I'm just like getting lazy. <laughs> but the the tens, especially in uh, Japan, it was really hot and humid, and I was playing uh, on this uh, Tiyoshi Nagabuchi, uh, big star over there that I, that I go over there and tour with sometimes. And uh, it's at like an aggressive rock gig. You're running yeah. around a lot and you're sweating and stuff. And, you know, I was, and a lot of solos and stuff. And I just felt like the strings were fighting me on some of the yeah. stuff I was playing. And I, I said to my tech one day, I said, am I crazy? Like, why do these strings feel like 11s? Like, they feel so heavy. And he's like, no, like, there's something, like, and it was so humid that summer. So then I read the story about Paul Gilbert that said something similar in an interview that huh. when, it, when, it, when it was really hot and humid, he felt like the strings were heavy. And I was like, Wow, maybe it's like just a, I don't know, some, something. So you should uh, come gigging uh, uh, for a summer in Nashville. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it yeah, is always I, nonstop humid. <laughs> I bet. You guys don't worry about stuff like this in Nashville because you're like real men guitar players out there with your, like, <laughs> like your, I don't know. I'm so scared of that place, man, the musicians in Nashville. It, where else can you go out and see, like, uh, you know, like any time of the week, you can go out and see somebody at two in the afternoon playing on Broadway just brilliantly, you know? Like <laughs> Bollinger? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, it's just the city, seems, they're everywhere, these guitar players in Nashville, so, but I love that city, it's fun. But you get the yeah. primos and, and you enjoy, yeah. you feel like, the, so like nines is, would be too much of, of a drop, and well, the nine and a halfs are so, you sweet know, spot? Actually, I kind of dig nines too these days. It depends on, uh, maybe you saw the Rick Beato video he did on uh, String yeah. Gauge. Yep. I thought that was great, Yeah. Uh, where he demonstrated, no, that was a Les Paul into a Marshall, where he showed different string gauges from, I think, maybe eights all the way to 11s or 12s. Or I believe so, yeah. And which ones actually sound best. Now, with that one particular tone, the Marshall, kind of dirty, JCM 800, I think it was, with a Les Paul, everybody kind of settled on the nines. And, and it's an interesting thing when you think about Eddie Van Halen uh, with, with an, old, uh, an old Marshall, you know, and they're not the tightest amps when you crank them way up. A, l a lighter string gauge, like a slightly thinner, can, can p it's all a formula, it's all a balance. Yeah. You know? So it really depends on what you're doing. I think if you're playing jazz or if you're, you know, you're Josh Smith or if you're, you know, you're using less gain, you want a really big, meaty guitar sound out of the guitar, maybe you're using single coils. See, there's another balance yeah. where it's like, it's all this balancing act. So it depends on what I'm doing. Like I feel like on a kind of 80s shred machine with high gain and a Marshall tone that could maybe use a little bit of tightening up. I don't mind nines at all, actually, because it's easier for me to play. Mm. Um, and yeah, you notice, I mean, like a lot of people talk about even in metal and stuff, but using tube screamers to lop the low end off the signal so that it tightens up the amp while adding a bit of boost into the front end. Well, you can lop a little bit of low end off the signal in a number of different ways, and one of them is like, lighter strings I yeah think. so you know so the, it's all a balance and I, I don't mind nines at all for my uh personally i could get used to them and i may go to nines one, at some point because that's what i used to use anyways you think you'd ever go down to eight like the rev billy g <sighs> eights feel a little too much okay but uh, there's this one string gauge which is the eddie van halen string gauge i have it on right over there on it there's a frankenstein guitar you can show on some b-roll after but it's a uh you know one of the evh frankensteins that guitar has the 9 to 40 gauge with a 15 gauge G. Ooh. So it's basically 9s, but you've got a 40 for the low E and a 15 for the G. That was the old Eddie Van Halen, uh, I think it was called the XL150 gauge that he used. And, you know, he tuned down a half step, and sometimes he was playing with a drop, you know, yeah, for Unchained and stuff, right? Yeah. The drop low string. And he somehow managed to make it in tune. And so um, I put him on that guitar, and for that style and everything, it, it kind of works. So I don't know, there's no rules, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, so whatever. And whatever works for the sound you're going for and the style you're playing in. So. Yeah. Well, should we move on to uh, another one of your yeah, treasure you trove? Some, some different guitars. Yeah. 
So this one, this is a relatively new acquisition. Um, we, you know, I've been talking already about Van Halen a bunch in this because he's my spiritual guitar godfather, I always yeah. say. So <laughs> I'm a Van Halen nut. And this guitar uh, was something that I had to have once I realized like just how much of those first couple albums were done on basically this yeah. guitar. It's a, uh, a 76 Ibanez Destroyer. Uh, with this, you know, Ed had one and it became the Shark guitar that he cut up and you so know, when you're going to do that i'm not going to <laughs> that's when he stopped using it evidently after he did that he said it didn't sound good anymore i guess but it's a, so this is made by ivan as it's a kind of a lawsuit guitar i, mean, I don't think they can make them after a couple of years because you know gibson probably went after him yeah but it's made out of although it looks a lot like a a carina uh, explorer from the late 50s it's actually made out of uh i believe japanese ash which they call sin and you can see it's actually a sandwich body. Oh yeah. So they sandwich two pieces together, and so who knows how many pieces of wood? It's actually it's probably six pieces of wood or something. The body, uh, but uh, it just sounds unbelievable, and it's got a neck like you know. So when I got this guitar, I got it from a guy in in Huntington Beach, and he had it advertised for uh, you know not like at a crazy cheap price, but a pretty reasonable price. Okay. Went down and met him in a parking lot, and as I'm driving down there, you know from LA, I thought. This guitar is probably gonna suck. It's probably gonna be, you know, like it, like not a great neck or something. You know, it's gonna yeah. be trash or just be heavy. Or, and he opened the case and I was just like, oh man, I was like, that's great. And then I picked it up and the neck is ferocious on it. So he told me that he'd had it about 20 years, and he got it from the fella that uh, started TV Jones pickups. Okay. Oh. So yeah. Tom, yeah. So it's got TV Jones uh, humbuckers in it. Usually TV Jones, you see their Filtertron yeah. style pickups, but he does make a couple sets, you know, a couple models. I guess a more a more PAF kind of thing. So that's what's in here. And these sound, whatever's going on, they sound fantastic in this guitar. I hit him up on uh, on Instagram and I said, Hey, do you remember like by any chance would you have had this guitar like all these years ago? And he writes me back basically in all caps, like, If you ever sell that guitar, you have to sell it back to me. He's like, I can't believe you have that guitar. Wow. And I was like, I love it, dude. It's great. So, you know. If, if you're out there, my friend, maybe you, you, we can share or something. You can, you know, come over on weekends <laughs> or something. I'm all about the love. So, hey, yeah. can we, it, it, with all that, you know, preface and that story, can we hear it? Yeah, it needs a little truss rod adjustment right now, but I can plug it in here and see what. Uh, let's let's tune up. So here's something that uh, is important. I've always got a tuner active on the floor. All right. So I got my my poly tune. Uh, down there, ready to go. As you can probably hear, the strings are dead as doornails. Yeah. So one of the thing around uh, around here is there's there's a lot of guitars, and I don't get to changing strings enough. How, does anybody like changing strings? I don't think so. I'm not really into it. I know, think maybe techs do because they get paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. right like Dallas Shoe, he keeps <clears throat> his bu days busy taking all care of all those U2 guitars. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still learning how to use my own pedal board, but anyway, you get the idea. The guitar is cool. <laughs> like all that, you know, all that. This is like it. This does that thing, and it's got this great chunky low end. Yeah. And um, so it's cool. Even in its dead string, uh, needs a truss rod adjustment state, it still kicks ass. I Before you had mentioned that you got it in the parking lot, I was going to ask, because I know that professionally you spend a lot of time over in Japan, and like I was curious yeah. if you got it over there, because me and Perry went over there, and they have a lot of those copies floating around, like Edwards, yeah. Bernie's. Yeah. So I didn't know if that's where you got it, but yeah, you got it in the parking lot. I got it in the parking <laughs> lot. I know what you mean. There's a guitar store there. If you dig Japanese, uh, Tokai's and Bernie's and yeah, all these Tokai's. great... Yeah, there's a store in Shinjuku, and I don't know what it's called but it's right above the store hyper guitars which is also an amazing it's a vintage store that will blow your mind you'll go in and it'll be a, a case full of 50s gold tops and a case full of 60s 335s yeah. and a, it's just like unbelievable store upstairs from hyper guitars if you ever go to tokyo there's a store that is four floors of mostly old japanese guitars Dang. and pedals and everything and it's just yeah. like it's mind-blowing so yeah <laughs> i love that stuff i mean i can just go burn days right looking at that stuff yeah, yeah. Well, should we keep the guitar parade moving? Yeah, let's do it. So I will mute here. Let's pick another one. 
I'm gonna, uh, actually, you know, the, the next one I should show you is my uh, previous signature model. Yeah. Because this has been my main, you know, main squeeze. People say, what's the one guitar, in, you know, Desert Island? Uh, that you would, you know, use for your rest of your career, and it's it's these, you know, either that I, I don't know if I could pick between this or the new one, but yeah. this guitar is the these are the ones that I take on gigs where I can only have one guitar because yeah. there's so many once again with the switching and all the different tones that I can get out of these instruments. So this one is way more, uh, like I say, our typical woods from our favorite guitars from Kalamazoo with yep. a mahogany body, mahogany neck actually, which is unique in a guitar like this, you know. And, uh, you know, for a, an S style, you know, double cut away guitar and the rosewood fingerboard and whatnot. And it's just a killer, you know, it's a, si it's a similar guitar in many ways to the other one and different in Got some it. ways. Is there a maple cap on That's that? A, yeah. Also, okay. That just making is, sure. Yeah. So they do the scrape binding. Okay. With the maple cap. And then I love the black back. And we did different colors on some of them for the backs. So a couple, some of them have black. Some one has red. The black top one has red on the back. And cool. it looks so like... Just kind of, I like them to look kind of uh, like understated, but rock and roll. Because I always say that my um, my role has been for many years a sideman. I've made most of my living touring as a sideman, even before doing YouTube and all that. Yeah. And so one minute I would have to fit in with Melissa Etheridge, the next Chris Cornell, the next Don Henley, yeah. you know, different folks that I've played with. And it's like, if you're a John Petrucci or Steve Vai, you know, you're an artist, you're a, uh, uh, you're a brand in your own, or yeah. whatever, I hate that word, but you know, you're a, and you can live in that, uh, you know, Steve's got crazy guitars with yeah. like the, the monkey grips and crazy inlays and all this. And in my job, I, you know, God bless it. Cause I, I would, that's everybody's dream to be a, a stylist and yeah. be respected for, you know, they've achieved the pinnacle. Yeah. But if you're a side man, you're many times not able to walk in with a guitar that's so unique and so that you know they'll look at you and go can't you play a telly on this you know or whatever <laughs> yeah. so i'm always bridging that gap with of trying to you know have a guitar that's unique and you you can look at it and go oh it's pete's it's his model but it, it'll fit in in a lot of situations mm. too so you know that's the yeah that's my thing yeah so this one uh this is a, a 63 ES-335 that I got around 2000 or 2001 or two. So I've had it 20 years. Okay. Um, this guitar, I remember going into a shop uh, in Hollywood, great shop uh, called Vintage Gear that used to sell a lot of funky stuff and pedals and they sold a lot of Supros and Airlines and everything almost before the White Stripes were cool yeah. and came out and they had a lot of like kind of funky off-brand gear and yeah. stuff, but it was a real cool store. And this came in. And uh, I remember uh, a great guitar player named, named David Kalish, that's just a brilliant uh, uh, LA guitar player. And he was playing an old Strat uh, when I walked in the store and everybody was just kind of hanging around. A lot of the, it had a lot of regulars that would come in the yeah. store. And he's playing brilliant stuff on the Strat and it sounded great. And then he grabbed this guitar. And what's this? We just got this 335, you know, and he gets it and he plugs it in and he hit one note and he goes, Oh, and then everybody forgot about the Strat. <laughs> That's what he said. I always remember. I was like, oh, that guitar's special. So this is it. Um, it. It had a really bad headstock break and a repair, and it has since broken again since I've had it. Wow. So a guy did a great repair on it where he's inlaid maple dowels on the back uh, and kind of fixed it up. It's not an invisible repair. You can definitely see the crack, but he salvaged the neck, so that was great. And it's had, you know, Grover tuners put on it. Evidently, I've never looked, but underneath the bridge pickup, uh, there's somebody went at it with a chisel. So <laughs> they took a bunch of wood out trying to maybe get at the electronics or something, because who knows, maybe they're trying to rewire it. Or, yeah. You know. um, so it's a player guitar. Yeah. You know, it's not at all original, but it was a great price because of that. I mean, less than what a new one would cost now for sure, like way less. So um, it's got an original PAF in the neck and a 60s you know pat patent number early patent number in the bridge and they're real low wind um pickups so i mean it's like 7.6k uh, or something in the bridge so a real low wind i'll just get it tuned up here and so because of that it definitely has that stringy that that thing we were talking about earlier where um you know it's almost like an overgrown single coil mm. now what do you gravitate for this guitar, like where do you where do you grab? Like for an why do you grab it? Or I'm oh. sorry, why do you grab it? Like why would you play this one in the context of all the sorts well, of things you do? So even though like these songs weren't played necessarily on a guitar like this, you know. <laughs> 
you know, like riffs like that, or uh, <laughs> that's the where this thing lives. You know, I went from the middle there for the, the Jimmy Page riff to the bridge for the Angus Young stuff, and you can hear this is the thing we were talking about earlier with PAFs because okay. this is an early patent number. This is a PAF, so but basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. you know? There's a real low wind, uh, so. <laughs> There's like a ton of twang to them. You know, there's a... You know, and they're almost like single coil output, really. It's like a, like, you know, mid 7K kind yeah. of output on these. So that's what I picked this thing up for, is all that twang, but it's, it's not a... Uh, I mean, it's almost what we think of in uh, some respects, I guess, as almost Gretschy. You know, hmm. that little bit of that twang. Yeah. And, you know, like I, I think of the early PAFs and Filtertrons too, there was even a little bit of crossover as far as the, like, you know. Where so. they sat. Yeah. But anyway, that's what I'll pick this up for. And it also just looks badass on yeah. stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've only taken it on a tour once. I took it out with Melissa Etheridge and uh, I took it to a rehearsal and I played it one song on it. She's like, you have to take that guitar on tour. She's like, that is the cool, like, she loved the sound and the look and everything. So, like, okay. I want to take it on tour, but I, I I'll nervous for you. Uh, well, you know, a little bit, but then it's like you got to take them out, and it's it's not about getting it ripped off or anything like that. It's more about like a break. I'm yeah. worried about you know because then it's gone. It's like, you know, if uh, I guess it'd be gone too if somebody took it, but um, <laughs> you know that could happen anywhere, I guess. So, but it it just uh, they're meant to be played, and it's a player at the end of the day. It's had the headstock repair and everything, so I just I like taking them out. You know, at this point, you only live once. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, should we? Uh, let's hear a couple more of these guitar stories. Yeah, sure. Um, so this guitar, um, I'm showing you guys because this was my main axe when I used to uh, tour with Chris Cornell. I, I used this on, you know, all the. All that, you can hear it's got a real deep, kind of cool overdrive. It's got a meaty kind of thing. And it's, yeah. a, it's a Les Paul Custom, just a run of the mill, I think 2000 uh, Les Paul Custom. It's quite heavy, it's probably 10, 10 and a half pounds. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it, I've been through a lot of miles with this guitar. This guitar I used to, with Chris, I used to hold out and sometimes he would, go, I, I saw this movie uh, that had Buck Dharma, uh, it, well it was a Blue Esther called in Black Sabbath movie called Black and Blue, if you ever catch oh. it. And it, it's Ronnie James Dio era Sabbath and Blue Esther called, and it, it was a movie on in a theater in my hometown and me and my sister went to it, I remember, and uh, this great concert movie. Uh, and at the end of the Blue Easter Cult set, uh, Buck Dharma ripped all the strings off his guitar. And I always remember him pulling the first, second, he just was ripping the strings, and then he on the low string. That was all he had left. I thought, that looks amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> so I used to do that, like in the set with Chris. I oh. totally stole it from you, Buck Dharma, if you're watching this. But <laughs> anyway, I ripped the strings off and stuff, and Chris would grab his mic and shove it into the pickup and stuff. And so this guitar got a lot of that abuse. Um, and uh, so, you know, we did that probably like 60 or 80 times at different gigs on tour. One day, I'm rehearsing with it uh, in kind of the last year that we were touring in the band. It's sitting mm. on, a, on a stand, and I backed into it. It was, a, you know, at a rehearsal studio. It was a carpet floor and kind of soft, and I saw the guitar kind of teeter, and then it just sort of very slowly went over, and Slow I watched motion. the headstock just... <laughs> So like, all the stuff that you and Chris did to it, yeah. and then it survived, and then you have a clumsy fall, boom. Yeah. I mean, I just tapped it, and it went over, and it was very kind of anticlimactic, the way that it's. So <laughs> it's got a headstock repair as well, this one. But these are the things that happen to your, you know, your road guitars. <laughs> play all that stuff it's just got it's a it's a meaty sounding Les Paul yeah yeah so do, do you have you changed anything to like the pickups or anything or stock as you got it oh yeah this guitar when I got it actually the Gibsons of the era uh, that were customs they had gold hardware so it was like kind of like I thought a little gaudy looking like it had the gold pickups and the gold bridge and everything but the white binding and I was like uh, I don't know you know I was used to seeing customs from the 60s and the early 70s that I'd have the kind of yellowed binding mm -hmm. and the gold had kind of faded and it almost looked chrome you know and it was like I want it to look a little more so so they said hey no problem we'll put chrome on it so they did that and the pickups I probably had seven sets of pickups in and out of this guitar um, but it's got thorn buckers in oh, okay. it now, my signature pickups yeah so and the pots uh, they've all been switched to um, I think a lot of Gibsons back then they had many times the 300k pots 
you know, so they weren't that open sound. They sounded yeah. muted. And um, so I got, I, I think these came from uh, a company called RS Guitar Works that used to sell these, you know, pre-wired kits. Oh, you yeah. buy it for your Les Paul. And so the whole electronics have been gutted in this. So what yeah. pots do you prefer then? Like, uh, not brand-wise, but like, K uh, in terms of value? Oh, uh, in, a, in a humbucker guitar, 500. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I mean, and a true 500 is nice, you know, because it, it's just less muted. I mean, I, I know there's a, you know, a certain uh, thing to a little bit more, whatever it is, resistance or capacitance or whatever you want to call it, if, if, if there's a bit of a drop off in the top end. And some guitars, it might work in a bright guitar, go for a 300K pot. But yeah, I tend to think I want them open and, and uh, airy sounding, okay. you know. And then if I want to back down the treble, I can roll, always roll the tone down on the guitar or do it at the amp. You yeah. Know? I don't like the idea of a pot being super lossy. You know, mm. like, mm. like, you know, I like, I like, I like the idea. I mean, I had a lot, for a long time, I played guitars in the eighties that just have one volume control, no tone. Eddie, once again, we come back to Eddie, you know, he, he was like a one volume control guy. He never liked having a tone control. And probably I bet it was cause he probably noticed a difference in the sound when, even when it's on 10 and it's in the circuit. Cause it's still drawing something. That's it's right. affecting it. Totally. Kind of yeah. like what you said before about the strings and everything. There's a lot more to the equation. Everything affects everything. It's yeah. a balance, all this stuff to me. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what's yeah. another friend we should meet? Okay. So now this one, uh, I guess I guess this can be the last one we, we do. Um, this is a really special guitar to me. Uh, I was on tour uh, with Chris Cornell in um, Nashville, a Nashville tour stop where you guys are from. Right. And Yeah, and I uh, went in Groons, and they had uh, this guitar. And, uh, you know, I, it had been a good year at that point. I'd been making some money, and it was like, I was like, really want to buy a guitar today you know yeah and i always wanted an old strat and i'd had a 66 that i had on tour but i kind of wanted a pre cbs guitar you know that was like i i was like now's maybe my chance to get one yeah you know? and they had a number of pre cbs strats in there now th there was a 60 and a 63 and a 61 and you know all these get, and they were get quite expensive this is a 64 and it had been refretted so a couple things that made it it's also a little beat and, yeah. and there's a few things that that made it more affordable than those other guitars and I remember going there with Yogi Lonich, the other guitar player in Cornell's band, and just plugging in guitars and trying them all out. And this one sounded every bit as good as the the, six, the, the earliest 60s ones. This is a November 64, so solidly pre-CBS yeah. with the nail plate and all that. But, um, but uh, you know, just right on the cusp of almost being a 65. And I just, it just, I got, I got the guitar at a special time in my life when I feel like I was, you know, living the rock dreams or whatever yeah. and having a great time. And I was able to get it. I remember that gig that night that Peter Frampton sat in. That oh, was the first wow. time I met him. And we've had a long friendship after that. But he's a wonderful guy. But anyway, so many, so many great things I remember about the day. You know, it's these times in your life where you're going to have bad days. This isn't going to be one of them. This yeah. is a good day. That was the day when I got this guitar. So <laughs> it's, it's great memories, you know. And <laughs> just has that thing, you know, it's just a really beautiful sounding old Strat. It just has a beautiful, uh, really beautiful... And, and the bridge stays in tune great. It's, you know, it's a, I've got it set way far forward, like yeah. after the Jeff Beck thing. You know, so I can really, I can really use it and utilize it and it just sounds really good. It's just a nice... Just does what I want it to do for for this kind of guitar. I can tell you really enjoy playing it too. Yeah, like <laughs> I do. I can sit and just write stuff like the, like on this guitar. Just get into it, you know, like some kind of groove, you know. Dial up some reverb or something like that, put on some compression, and then come up with a vibe. And this is a great guitar to just sit around and play all day like that. It's oh, it's, it's funny because it's like we've done this for a long, long time, and we've heard a lot of a lot of guitars, seen a lot of guitars. And my I think my favorite part about this gig is 
not being able to see like, oh, this is a 64 Strat, and hold it? Is it more like hearing you have such a connection to an instrument that takes you to a place in time mm -hmm. that is so positive? And it's like, it's like, you know, when you hear a song and then you, you think of a smell or a certain like memory that you had like on a first date or something. It's just, oh, yeah. it's just like, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very positive time capsule. And that's like kind yeah. of like the reinvigoration of what we get to do here. Both you as a player and a musician and myself is that yeah. trying to bring out these stories of the instruments. Yeah, I mean, they, get, they take on a life of their own, you know. It's like, it's, they're, they're pieces of art that you can actually use, like, yeah. uh, you know, to, you know, it's like, because there's so much, I, I can remember being a kid just like getting my first guitar, which was a Strat copy, uh -huh. plywood and everything was a Hondo, you know, but it, <laughs> was, it was like magic to me, you know, I'd sit there and just look at it like this, all the angles and stuff. Yeah. Like, God, like, it's so beautiful, you know, and I'm like 10 years old, just going like, uh, I, I something about guitars, you know, and so to, yeah, we're just like, I'm, I'm just like a big kid that's still just doing the same thing as I was then, I guess. <laughs> well, I'm going to be a big kid and break the rules. I'm going to ask yeah. for one more guitar, one more. I think, I okay. think there's one more story that should be told. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Okay, so last but certainly not least is, of course, the EVH Frankenstein. I got one of these a while ago because... How can you not? It's just like, when I look at this guitar in here, it makes me happy. Yeah. Like when you walk in and just turn the lights on in the room, you're like, ah. <laughs> my old yeah. friend. My my old, <laughs> totally, you know, it's just that vibe. And um, it's it's such a fun guitar to just have a, a, around. And I'm a, I'm a Van Halen nut, so it's like, you know, you, I, I don't know, it's just a blast to have, yeah. have this around. So uh, the amp that I'm actually playing through right now, too, is a is a basically Eddie Eyes uh, amp. It's a it's a, a Sur SL 68, so 68 plexi, and it's on 10 with the Variac thing and everything. So it's got the. Ooh, it's loud. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not have fun, you know, with a guitar like this? It's, it's one it's thing a, to play yeah. those riffs and be as accurate as you are when you're doing it, but to have like the whole motif of everything like it, you look the part. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, how can you not? You know, it's just like he's, he was such a genius, you know, just brilliant. And having one of these around to just kind of, you know, blaze it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just fun, fun to shred on. Uh, yeah, I love it. So, hey, the, the EVH gear guys, I mean, to come up with a guitar like this, that's st still pretty affordable for having the paint pattern and everything, you yeah. know, and just making all of us uh, happy. Yeah, right. You know, it's, it's a fun guitar. And I, I've seen Paul Gilbert with one. He's a diehard Ibanez guy. You know, I've seen yeah. um, uh, Andy Wood's got one. He's a diehard Sir guy. And we're all like, you got to get that EVH yeah. guitar. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> Even if you've got your own signature guitar, you got to get that guitar, you know. So, yeah, we're all, we're all uh, yeah. <laughs> bow down at the church bed. So, yeah. Now, if you want to grab your Thorn guitar from yeah. Sewer, and then we can kind of go through the rest of your gear setup. Okay, let's do that. All right, Pete, so we have tons of gear behind us. Why don't you walk us through how you're so quickly able to go from amp to amp to setting to setting so people can get a flavor of how that works for you? For sure. So right now, um, I'm basically running into my pedal board, which we'll show in a bit, and I'm coming out of there into this amp switcher that's up here. So it's called the Amp Pete. And 88S that's how, up there. How, how appropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's another Pete. But yeah, <laughs> he's a great dude and he made a brilliant device because you can literally switch between eight different amplifiers and eight different cabinets Jeez. or load boxes. So output. So it's a, it's a router for your studio and it's amazing. I've got a remote here on the desk that allows me to switch right from the desk to different amps and, and, and outputs. So, uh, you know, I've got a bunch of different amps here. I've got a lot in the kind of the Marshall sort of uh, category, you okay. know, that because I just love those sounds. But like, so for example, up there, there's an old 50 watt 72 uh, uh, JMP head. And then there's a, a bunch of the Synergy stuff oh, yeah. here on the next shelf, um, which is preamp and power amp based. And then I've got a Soldano uh, SLO 100 here. There's a Sir made Jim Kelly reverb down there, down on the floor. I'm not sure if you can see it, but yep. that's uh, the Sir SL68. It's kind of 60, 68 style plexi amp, basically. All right. Then I've got my signature Sir 100 watt head here, the PT100, which is, this is probably gets the most use in my videos because it's got a brilliant clean channel and it's just very versatile with the overdrive channels and stuff. So this is kind of home base, really. I mean, it has your name on it. So. And, and it's got my name on it. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it sounds like I want it to sound and, and whatnot. Um, 
couple other heads that I've got here, and because I've run out of, uh, I've got too many amps here basically for the room. So that's it's. I've got the uh, the Comet here, which is a, a brilliant amp. The Top Hat. This is like an AC30. Yeah. Uh, and then the Sir Hedgehog, which is kind of dumbly. All of these, if I want to get to one of these, I just pull the cable out of here, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> out of yeah. this guy, and then I pull the speaker cable in the back, and I'll switch to these four heads. And then, uh, last but certainly not least, over here behind me, there's a PT15, which is my 15 watt signature amp from Sir. So any of those, um, and sometimes I have a combo over there in the corner too, I can switch with that 88RS instantly. So I can show you wow. uh, what that sounds like. Yeah. So I, I'm running uh, the output right now on the, on the amp out to an old Marshall uh, cabinet in the other room. It's a late 70s with a blackback G12M 75 hertz speakers, and it's mic'd up with a 57 and an AT4050, so that's what you're hearing. And if I'm on what I call amp one here in the room, it's that Marshall. <laughs> If I want to go to that Soldano, I simply just have to type in 03 here, and now you're hearing the Soldano. Right, and now if I want to go to the Kelly that's right below it, I just type in 4, go like this. And... So I can get all the way from you know one amp to the other in two seconds, right? The SL68 is the next one. Go to that. And you're hearing the that's the Marshall on tan with a very axis, a little squishier, and doing that whole thing. Mm. Uh, this guy is number six. Over there, so like this. And the reason that you know this amp, um, you can hear right away why I use it uh, for pedal videos a lot and stuff. I'll hit it with a distortion box. It's just a great fendery kind of clean channel that works great with gain pedals and stuff. So I'm mainly doing pedal demos and stuff through the channel one of the PT100. It's pretty much a straight up optimized somewhere between a twin and a super reverb sort of so circuit. For this one, yeah. real quick, what tubes do you have in it? I'm not. This this amp has EL uh, 34s. Okay. And so it's four EL 34s. You're always, you know, with an amp that's trying to do a lot of different things, yeah. you kind of got to pick whether you go 6L6s, EL34s, what kind of output transformer. So it's a Plexi style output transformer and EL34, so a very Marshall uh, based power amp, but, you know, with the, the, the Fendery clean channel. Mm -hmm. If I go over to the other channels, it's a, then it's, you know, high gain monster. <laughs> You know, that's the channel two on there, and it's got a boost built in and everything. So it's a, it's a high gain uh, machine, but with a brilliant clean channel. Mm. So that's a, you know, a touring amp that we developed this amp uh, around 20, well, I think it was like 2009. John originally came to me and said, I was using three different amps on stage. I was using like switching between all these amps. He goes, hey man, why don't you let me try and make you one amp mm -hmm. and with a couple different channels and see if I can make you happy. Yeah. That's how this thing started. Um, this version is actually the 2014. It's an old, an, an old model. We don't have this faceplate on it anymore or anything, but it's my studio amp that I have in here. So cool. cosmetics have changed a bit so yeah. over the years, but yeah. So brilliant, brilliant amp for the studio. So um, while I'm on this sound, now why don't I show you like really quick so you get the idea. I can switch between the different amps really quickly. Right now I'm running out into the Marshall cabinet in the other room, right? But if I want to, I could, for instance, switch to right behind me here can show it in B-roll maybe. I've got a Sir Reactive Load IR, which okay. is a load box that takes the amp all the way to line level and then adds some speaker simulation. I can switch to that simply by going like this. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the Sir Load Box. This is the live cab in the other room. If I want to, I can also go to this Two Notes Captor X box right over here which has, a, I've got these Dyne IRs that they make, you know, mm -hmm. it's an impulse response signature package. So that's what you're gonna hear now. This is my signature Dyne IRs. So a bunch of different flavors of Greenback 412. Yeah. Two of them are virtual, and one of them's the real thing, with the cab in the other yeah. room. Yeah. So, yeah. It's crazy how much, like, I call that like the tone speed dial, you know, yeah. from my childhood yeah. with all the little things we had on our old dial, rotary phone. But yeah, yeah, that's like a tone speed dial. You're just dialing it up and boom, you're ready to fly. Boom, 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 from sound to sound. It's like if I need a open back style cabinet, I can do that in the virtual world really quickly with the Dyne IRs. Yeah. Or if it's like, oh, I need a boxy sound for this, then I can switch to that. Or, you know, uh, and, and the other thing about it is that it's silent, of course. When I'm using the load boxes, there's no... You know, so that they're great yeah. for, for if you got a home studio yeah. and you're trying to record, you know, the reactive load or the two notes. Um, just they've been a godsend for people to 
do pro sounding work uh, at uh, you know you can do it through headphones. You with baby sleeping in the next yeah. room, and it, and you can have a raging hundred watt amp. So, but I, and you know it's a testament. I mean I think the technologies you can hear it's basically like different shades uh, that I've got going right now of good sound. You know between the three. <laughs> It's like they're they're all usable and good tones yeah. that I think, and so it's the technology's come a long way where you don't have to have a mic cab. I don't think anymore. You know? Yeah, and, it reminds yeah. me of the RJ rundown we've done, where you guys are you know not only doing video demos but you're also writing, recording, yeah, doing that kind of thing, and you want to find uh you know like a, a spark any way you can get it, yeah, and that might be changing tones, and to do that while you have the creativity on the tip of your frontal lobe is like that's really resourceful. Hundred percent and fast work. Like that's my other yeah. thing is I like to get things done quickly. So because it's like you know when you're your own video editor, you're, you're I'm the camera guy in here. I'm the guy writing the songs. I'm engineering. <laughs> you do it. So you need to come up with your flow yeah. in the studio to where you can get things done quickly. I was really inspired by Tim Pierce, mm. uh, who you know is a very he's a visionary. I feel like in this business, amazing guitar player, but he also has this ability to see forward into the future. And how can I? You know, he's, he wants to be employed, and how can I maximize my potential so that I can get work done quick, you know, earn an income, earn, yeah. earn a living, and all that stuff in a very efficient way where you don't burn out, and, you know. Because if I had to get up and plug things, oh, you know, it's like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but when you can just switch things very quickly and with some pedals at your feet and then get some, some sounds really quickly, you can work really quick and then you stay inspired, get onto the, you know, stay in the music. Yeah. As opposed to, like, you know. The, the configuration. <laughs> yeah, like the tech ruling you. It's like the tech's good enough now where, you know, it's amazing that, that if you if you design it just right, it's like you can get some great results really quickly, mm. you know. So, you know, that's kind of the amps. And then, like, on on that note, I think also I can show you, like, really quickly here in Logic, which I record into, uh, I've got a template here that has a bunch of stuff up on the on the channel strip so i've got like delays and things that i can okay. just dial in really quickly so you just heard a bunch of dry sounds you know by just pulling up some uh by just pulling up some some effects sins i can now uh oops, sorry let's see here i'm gonna switch this to three so now i've got oh. a stereo ping pong delay going yeah. i got a little bit of reverb and i got a little bit of i think some little bit of even tight h3000 on this so it's wet. I've got it rather wet sounding yeah. right now, but to show you that, you know, and I just kind of have that stuff up on the strip in Logic all the time, where I've got a few various plugins, a couple different delays, the H3000, uh, a black hole reverb from Eventide, which mm. you heard me playing through with the Strat earlier when it was mm -hmm. real ambient and super long reverb tail and stuff. So I can quickly just pull those sends up and stuff, and then I've got a, like an inspiring ambient sound or an inspiring lead sound yeah. with a little bit of ping pong delay or all that, just quick, quick, quick. And just like know? one checkbox and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. So I, I recommend doing that, like make templates in your DAW and come up with, you know, lay it out so that your mics are all configured and everything's laid out. And then on the channels, you've got some effects you can quickly send to and get inspired. You know, like in, t in you know, 10 minutes, you can have a great guitar sound going with some cool stuff on it. And then, you know, people, a lot of people say, like, how do you write all these songs in your videos? Because every demo video I do, I start with a original song. And I'm like, that's the fun part. Like, the writing a song isn't hard. Because if, if you set your stuff up so that it's easy to work, I just sit down and, you, you know, get an inspiring tone. And mm. then it's like, play a couple notes. And it's like, well, that's cool. There's a little song right there. You yeah. Know? And if it's just a dry guitar sound and the same thing every day, uh, maybe it's not as inspiring, you know, but if you got a few, I guess I like effects, you know, I like yeah. adding some effects. Clearly, as we walked into your uh, office, we'll call it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of pedals everywhere. Yeah, well, that, and that's just part of the job, I guess, too, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, you it's know, the downside videos. of the job, having pedals everywhere. No, 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 it's a good, it's an amazing, are you kidding? when I was 14, <laughs> if you would have told me, like, this is what I'd be doing, it'd be like, it's not exactly what I had in mind, but it's sure cool. <laughs> you know, it's not lost on me, I have a good time with, yeah. with all this stuff, you know, it's fun, so, yeah. Well, I know that yeah. you probably have a lot of moving parts in terms of like pedal boards, but this probably is maybe maybe your main one for the studio and what you do for YouTube and stuff. So yep. might want to quickly go through these pedals here. Yeah, absolutely. So the board that you see here uh, has been through a few changes, but it's really been kind of like this for about at least four or five years now. It's my touring board, and I also just moved it in here eventually and went like, I don't know, let's put it on the desk and it'll just be there at my feet when I can you know have a few pedals to hit. So. Yeah. 
Um, there's a couple different paths in this pedal board. So there's the what I call the pre-path and the post-path. The post path is what I would normally plug into the effect loop of an amplifier okay. if I was playing live, and it's all this stuff. It's the two H9s and the timeline delay. I don't actually really use that in here, because if I'm doing delays, I'll do it in the DAW. Like mm. most, you, know, you add it on the channel and you can get great delays in Logic or Pro Tools or whatever you use. So I'm not doing that there so much. Occasionally I'll plug in if there's a specific sound I want out of one of those pedals. But more uh, often than not, I'm using everything else. That's what I'm using. So that that runs in front of the amp switcher that's, that's all right. hitting all the amps, right? So. And not to like that you have to de demonstrate the differences, but why why have two H9s? What's the well purpose? Originally, when I did the board, um, I think it's going all the way back to when I was playing with, with Don Hanley, and I, I used up a uh, pitch uh, effect, like so to do harmonies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a diatonic pitch effect, but I also needed a reverb at the same time. So I was like, there's going to be instances where I need two of these. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Gotcha. So, so that was it. And it's an overkill. I could probably get away with one. Yeah. Honest, you know, and just have a reverb pedal or something, but I just added the two H9s, and that's been the way it's been. So. Um, so, guitar's running uh, into the side of the board, and the first couple things that it's hitting are actually the tuner, the polytune, the Unit 67 there from Dry Bell, which is a real cool pedal, the Freakout, and the Wah. And uh, I call the Unit 67 slot there, that's called a pedal du jour. Like, I can switch that out <laughs> if I want. It's such a great pedal, I don't generally switch it that much, because that's an awesome pedal. It's a really unique compressor boost. EQ, just kind of like a way to, it's just a cool front end yeah. for the guitar sound. But it's, it's um, you know, I can switch that out real easy and put a different pedal there. Um, the Freakout is a pedal that I use to, even with a clean sound. Right? Even with a clean sound, I can get feedback. That's so rad. when you got a studio and you don't have a, a loud, you know, cab in the room with you, you can't get feedback, that's a way you can get a feedback effect that, mm. uh, you know, it's very natural sounding, so I'll use it to tail out things and get, get feedback. Yeah. So I love having that. And then the little Dunlop Mini Wah is great too. That's awesome. And then, so coming out of all that stuff, then we're going into the Music Home Lab switcher there. So that is a, where all the rest of the pedals are plugged in. And I can switch in and out the different loops and stuff, and it's buffered. I get a great, you know, clean signal going all the way to the amp switcher and out to the amps via the Music Home. So, um, I can really easily switch in some of the different, like this is a, uh, a woodshed compressor. Uh, this is a fuzz. Uh, it's a Ryra uh, Big Muff clone. Uh, loop 3, I have that Mobius in there, and I've got that switched in for when I want to do any kind of like, uh, let's see what I got dialed up here. broken record sound. Yeah, you know, I, love I was going to say some AM radio. <laughs> yeah, it's an inspiration box to me. I mean, I just I just love it. So, or, you know, swell, right? That's that's neat. Tremolo. So it's my modulation box that, that I can just switch in and get a flanger going, get a swell going, get a chorus going, or that broken sound, you know, the broken AM kind mm. of sound. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Then I've got a phase 90 on there. Tremolo. Uh, I've got a Klon style boost, which is a Rocket Archer. I don't really use it in front of a sound like that so much. It'll be more to boost a dirty sound. And I use it more when I want a really, really big like, I want the notes to be huge. I don't play a lot of rhythm guitar through the Archer. It's more like when you want the single notes to be big. And then I've also got a uh, 808 style pedal. So right there, that was the difference between the first one being the Screamer uh -huh. and the second one being the Archer. A little bit more of the skinny mids thing, or a little bit more of the great big full note thing with the Archer. Was uh, that actual uh, Ibanez pedal, or is it, what, what, which, or is it a clone? It's a Maxon called the Apex okay. 808. Just yeah, sure. supposedly the guy that designed the original Screamer, he did you know years of research and found the ultimate chip to make the <laughs> ultimate 808. You know, I don't know, but that was the story, and it is a great sounding 808 style pedal. So it's a Maxon Apex okay. 808. 
That's what that was. And then I've got a, uh, this is a Echoplex style. It's, it's actually in a, a, the MXR Echoplex pedal. So I've got that there if I need a little delay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then last but not least, I got a Source Audio uh, Zio, which I have set to the low cut boost. It's a real cool, versatile boost pedal that'll take a sound like this and tighten it up and make it just like a little more. That's with it off. Sounds a little more like a Jose Marshall or something when you turn it on because it's like it's get, it adds top end boost and, and cuts the, the, the low end. It makes it real aggressive and like early Metallica or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a fun pedal. Uh, and that's the pedal board basically and once once again, you know with this just stuff at my feet You know, it's just really easy to uh, many times just I'll be like, oh, I'll grab the phaser or I'll hit the, the freak out <laughs> It's gonna do that would that's be, a fun pedal yeah if, if 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 i heard that i'd be like oh i don't like that particular preset so i'll try this one. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what it's gonna do it's but it's it's, it's a really fun pedal. it's like taming yeah. a mustang you know yeah. trying to <laughs> yeah trying to tame the bronco yeah well when you're in a studio like this you want to sound wild sometimes and not always like you're in an isolated room right so yeah it's, it's helpful for for that yeah so that's that's kind of it, you know. I just have the pedals there at the feet to hit the the different amps and stuff, and I can add those effects or do the ones post in Logic, and uh, that's how I work in here. Pete, I can't yeah. thank you enough. Uh, Pete Thorne here, everybody. He came. He he answered the call when we asked to see if we could do a rig rundown. He said, "Please come on, and hang out, and talk gear." Thank you so much, sir. It's an honor, man. I mean, honestly, uh, and we've you know had an association working together over the years yeah. with the column and everything that I used to do for you guys. Yep. And so it was when you guys called me up, I was like, 100%, absolutely, I got to do that. So yeah. thank you, thank you so much for having me. I really yeah. appreciate it. Everyone, yeah. uh, if you're not subscribed to our channel, do that. Go over to Pete's channel, subscribe to that. You get all the guitar goodness you can handle. Promise you. Thanks, everybody.